We are continuing our discussion of hemodynamic disorders. This is a lecture free on this topic and the two previous lectures you should be able to locate on Google Disk. Today we will discuss uh, thrombosis, but before delving into this topic, I would like to remind you about normal hemostasis. Normal hemostasis comprises a series of regulated processes that maintain blood in a fluid, clot-free state in normal vessels while rapidly forming a localized hemostatic plug at the site of vascular injury. Because the pathologic counterpart of hemostasis is thrombosis, the formation of blood clot, or also known as thrombus, happens within intact vessels. Both hemostasis and thrombosis involve three elements, the vascular wall, platelets, and the coagulation cascade. The discussion here begins with normal hemostasis and its regulation. The main steps in the process of hemostasis and its regulation are summarized in the diagram that appears on your slide. We will cons consider all steps of this process. After vascular injury, local neurohumoral factors induce a transient vasoconstriction. Vascular injury causes transient arteriolar vasoconstriction through reflex neurogenic mechanisms augmented by local secretion of endothelin, a potent endothelium-derived vasoconstrictor. This effect is fleeting. However, and bleeding would quickly resume if not for the activation of platelets and coagulation factors. Endothelial injury exposes highly thrombogenic subendothelial extracellular matrix, um, abbreviated as ECM, that facilitates platelet adherence, activation, and aggregation. The formation of the initial platelet plug is known as primary hemostasis. Endothelial injury also exposes tissue factor, also known as factor-free or thromboplastin. This tissue factor is a membrane-bound pro procoagulant glycoprotein synthesized by endothelial cells. Exposed tissue factor, acting in conjunc conjunction with factor 7, is the major in vivo trigger of the coagulation cascade and its activation eventually culminates in the activation of thrombin which has several roles in regulating coagulation. Activated thrombin promotes the formation of an insoluble fibrin clot by cleaving fibrinogen. Thrombin also is a potent activator of additional platelets which serve to reinforce the hemostatic plug. This sequence known as secondary hemostasis, results in the formation of a stable clot capable, clot capable of preventing further hemorrhage. Counter-regulatory mechanisms, such as release of tissue plasminogen activator uh, that appears to be a fibrinolytic product, along with the release of thrombone modeling that interferes with the coagulation cascade. So these counter-regulatory mechanisms, they limit the hemostatic process to the site of injury.
Let's discuss in greater detail the roles of endothelium, platelets, and the coagulation cascade. Endothelial cells are central regulators of hemostasis. The balance between the anti- and pro-thrombotic activities of endothelium determine whether thrombus formation, propagation or dissolution occurs. Normal endothelial cells express a variety of anticoagulant factors that inhibit platelet aggregation and coagulation and promote, promote fibrinolysis. After injury or activation, however, this balance shifts and endothelial cells acquire numerous procoagulant activities. Besides trauma, endothelium can be activated by microbial pathogens, hemodynamic forces, and a number of pro-inflammatory mediators. Endothelium plays several roles. It has antithrombotic pro properties, and they include inhibitory effects on platelets, and inhibitory effects on coagulation factors. Intact endothelium prevents platelets, along with plasma coagulation factors, from engaging the highly thrombogenic subendothelial extracellular matrix. Non-activated platelets do not adhere to normal endothelium. Even with activated platelets, including prostacycline or prostaglandin and nitric oxide, they produce, are produced by endothelium and they impede their adhesion. Both mediators also are potent vasodilators and inhibitors of platelet aggregation. Their synthesis by endothelial cells is stimulated by a number of factors produced during coagulation. These factors that stimulate, uh, that, that are stimulated during the process of coagulation include thrombin and cytokines. Endothelial cells also produce adenosine diphosphatase which degrades adenosine diphosphatase and further inhibits platelet aggregation. Inhibitory effects on coagulation factors are presented on this slide. These actions are mediated by factors expressed on endothelial surfaces, particularly heparin-like molecules, thrombomodulin, and tissue factor pathway inhibitor. The heparin-like molecules act indirectly. They are cofactors that greatly enhance the inactivation of thrombin and other coagulation factors by the plasma protein antithrombin-3. Thrombomodulin also acts indirectly. It binds to thrombin, thereby modifying the substrate specificity of thrombin, so that instead of cleaving fibrinogen, it instead cleaves and activates protein C, an anticoagulant. Activated protein C inhibits clotin by cleaving and inactivating two procoagulants, factor 5A and factor 8A. It requires a cofactor, protein C, which is also synthesized by endothelial cells. Finally, tissue factor pathway inhibitor directly inhibits tissue factor factor 
7a complex and factor 10a. Fibrinolysis and the filial cell synthesized tissue type plasminogen activator, a protease that cleaves plasminogen to plasmin. Plasmin in turn cleaves fibrin to degrade thrombi. Prothrombotic properties of injured or activated endothelium include three very important components. Activation of platelets, activation of clotting factors, and antifibrinolytic effects. In the filial injury, shown on the left picture, brings platelets into contact with the sub in the filial ECM, which includes among its constituents von Willebrand factor, uh, that is abbreviated as VWF, a large multimetric protein that is synthesized by endothelial cells, shown on, pic on your picture on the right. Von Willebrand factor is held fast to the extracellular matrix through interactions with collagen and also binds tightly to glycoprotein 1b, a glycoprotein found on the surface of platelets. These interactions allow von Willebrand factor to act as a sort of molecule glue that binds platelets tightly to denuded vessel walls. Platelet adhesion and aggregation is shown on the left picture. On the right picture, you see the small fragment of the inner layer of vessel and interaction between factors in detail. Von Willebrand factor functions, functions as an adhesion bridge between some sub-endothelial collagen and the glycoprotein 1B platelet receptor. Platelet aggregation is accomplished by fibrinogen binding to platelet glycoprotein 1B3A receptors on different platelets. Congenital deficiencies in the various receptors or bridging molecules lead to the diseases like Bernard-Soulier syndrome, Glanzmann thromboasthenia, von Willebrand disease. The most common symptoms of these syndromes is bleeding that manifests like purpura, nosebleeds, gingival bleeding and menorrhagia. We will focus our attention on platelets. Platelets are unnucleate cell fragments shed into the bloodstream by marrow megakaryocytes. They play a critical role in normal hemostasis by forming a hemostatic plug that seal vascular defects and by providing a surface that recruits and concentrates activated coagulation factors. Platelet function depends on several integrin family glycoprotein receptors, a contractile cytoskeleton and two types of cytoplasmic granules, alpha granules shown by the red star on the left, which express the adhesion molecule P-selectin on their membranes and contain fibrinogen, fibronectin, factors 5 and 8, platelet factor 4, that is heparin-binding chemokin, platelet-derived growth factor and transforming growth factor beta. The other uh, receptor is known as gamma granules, shown by the black star 
dense bodies which contain adenine nucleotides, ADP and ATP, ionized calcium, histamine, serotonin, and epinephrine. After vascular injury, platelets encounter extracellular matrix constituents. And among those constituents, collagen is the plays the most important role. So platelets encounter extracellular matrix constituents and adhesive glycoproteins, such as von Willebrand factor. This sets in motion a series of events that lead to platelet adhesion and platelet activation, along with platelet aggregation. Let's consider all these events. Platelet adhesion initiates clot formation and depends on von Willebrand factor and platelet glycoprotein 1b. Under shear stress, as in cases of flowing blood, von Willebrand factor undergoes a conformational change, assuming an extended shape that allows it to bind simultaneously to collagen in the extracellular matrix and to platelet, glyco, uh, platelet glycoprotein 1b. The importance of this adhesive interaction is highlighted by genetic deficiencies of von Willebrand factor and glycoprotein 1b, both of which result in bleeding disorders known as von Willebrand disease and Bernard Soulier disease, uh, which is considered a very rare condition. Platelet adhesion leads to an irreversible shape change and secretion or release reaction of both granule types, a process known as platelet activation. Calcium and adenosine diphosphate released from gamma granules are especially important in subsequent events since calcium is required by several coagulation factors and adenosine diphosphate is a potent activator of resting platelets. Activated platelets also synthesize thromboxam A2, a prostaglandin that activates additional nearby platelets and that also has an important role in platelet aggregation. During activation, platelets undergo a dramatic change in shape from smooth discs to spheres with numerous long spiky membrane extension shown by the blue star on the picture, as well as more subtle changes in the makeup of their plasma membranes. The shape changes enhance subsequent aggregation and increase the surface area available for interaction with coagulation factors. The subtle membrane changes include an increase in the surface expression of negatively charged phospholipids, which provide binding sites for both calcium and coagulation factors and a conformation change in platelet glycoprotein 2b and 3a that permits it to bind fibrinogen. Platelet aggregation follows platelet adhesion and activation and is stimulated by some of the same factors that induce platelet activation, such as thromboxam A2. Aggregation is promoted by bridging interactions between fibrinogen and glycoprotein 2B3A receptors 
on adjacent platelets. The importance of this interaction is emphasized by a rare inherited deficiency of glycoprotein to B3A, known as Glanzmann thrombasthenia, which is associated with bleeding and an inability of platelets to aggregate. Recognition of the central role of glycoprotein to be free A receptors in platelet aggregation has stimulated the development of antithrombotic agents that inhibit glycoprotein to be free A function. Concurrent activation of the coagulation cascade generates thrombin, which stabilizes the platelet plug through two mechanisms. Thrombin activates a platelet surface receptor known as protease activate receptor, which in concert with adenosine diphosphate and thromboxam further enhances platelet aggregation. Platelet contraction follows creating an irreversibly fused mass of platelets that constitutes the definitive secondary hemostatic plug. Thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin within the vicinity of the plug, cementing the platelet plug in place. Here we can make a preliminary conclusion there are two stages in the process of hemostasis, primary and secondary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis includes response to vascular injury, formation of the platelet plug adhering to the endothelial wall and limitation of bleeding immediately. Secondary hemostasis includes it results in formation of a stable clot. It involves the activation of coagulation proteins that function to produce fibrin as a reinforcement of the platelet plug, and it gradually stabilizes the plug that is dissolved by fibrinolysis. The coagulation cascade constitutes the third arm of the hemostatic system. The coagulation cascade is a successive series of amplifying enzymatic reactions. At each step in the process, a proenzyme is proteolyzed to become an active enzyme which in turn proteolyzes the next proenzyme in the series, eventually leading to the activation of thrombin and the formation of fibrin. On the picture, you can see a schematic representation of the coagulation cascade. The coagulation cascade can be activated during hemostasis via the intrinsic pathway, the contact system on your left, or the extrinsic pathway shown on the right, that ultimately converge on the common pathway of coagulation. Both pathways lead to the activation of factor X and subsequently of thrombin, factor 10, and subsequently of thrombin, which is required for the conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin and for activation of factor 13. The fibrin clot is cross-linked and stabilized by factor 13. Coagulation factors are indicated with F followed by Roman numeral an additional A denotes the activated form. So pay attention to this picture. Modern clinical labs assess uh, hemostasis uh, 
using diagnostic tests. Pro-thrombine time screens for the activity of the proteins in the extrinsic pathway factors 7, 10, 2, 5 and fibrinogen. Partial thromboplastin time screens for the activity of the proteins in the intrinsic pathway factors 12, 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, 2 and fibrinogen. Platelet concentration generally range from 100,000 to 300,000 platelets. Normal thrombin time is approximately 10 seconds. Thrombin time measures the time required for a specific thrombin concentration to clot anticoagulated plasma. Thus, the application of the basic laboratory investigation to clinical observations and the reapplication to the bedside of the knowledge gained provides the clinician with the means to delineate most of the hemostatic problems that are clinically significant. Now I want to show you two cases that illustrate hemostatic issues and difficulties that the clinician faces when creating a diagnosis. We will look at the case report of Glanzmann thrombasthenia, published in 2018. A female patient of 10 years of age uh, reported with bleeding gums for the period of four days. Her medical history included multiple episodes of spontaneous bleeding from the gums um, for several days. There was also prolonged bleeding following minor trauma. She had a history of epistaxis and melina, a grayish-black stool. The patients reported that she had been diagnosed with some bleeding disorder. She had no family history of bleeding. The patient was poorly nourished. She was pale. During the examination, the doctors paid attention to ecchymosis on both arms and in the wrist. Oral examination revealed spontaneous gingival bleeding from upper and lower tooth causing stains all over the surface. Considering the history and clinical examination, a preliminary diagnosis of Glanzmann thrombasthenia was given. Differential diagnoses considered were von Willebrand disease, Bernard Soulier syndrome and platelet secretory defects. The patient was then subjected to hematological investigation, which showed normal platelet count, normal prothrombin time, normal partial thromboplastin time, normal thrombin time, Bleeding time, however, was prolonged. It constituted more than 15 minutes. Factor 8 fibrinogen and von Willebrand factor showed normal values. Hemoglobin level was 12 and mean corpuscular volume was 75.6, which indicated microcytic <coughs> hypochromic anemia. Based on the history, clinical findings and lab results, the final diagnosis of Glanzmann thrombasthenia with microcytic hypochromic anemia was confirmed. In conclusion, it could be said that the Glanzmann thrombasthenia is a rare autosomal recessive bleeding disorder characterized by prolonged bleeding time, defective aggregation of platelets, and impaired clot, clot retraction. The common features of Glanzmann's thrombasthenia are bruising, epistaxis, gingival hemorrhage, and menorrhagia. Bruising typically occurs following minor trauma, 
The laboratory tests of these patients show prolonged bleeding time, decreased or absence of clawed retraction, and abnormal platelet aggregation responses to physiological stimuli. And all this stood positive for our patient. The spontaneous bleeding episodes from the gingiva in the oral cavity and ecchymotic patches on the skin further confirmed the medical condition in this patient. We are going to look at the second case, uh, this time related to von Willebrand's disease. This uh, case was published in 2017. The 27-month-old boy who had been referred to the hospital due to hemorrhagic shock. The boy had been born full term at 39 weeks with a birth weight of 3 kilograms 200 grams. He was uh, excessively breastfed. There were no incidents during vaccinations. Food diversification has started at six months old. His weight, length, and psychomotor development were within the normal range. He was until yet not circumcised. Prior to the symptoms, the child was described as a good eater. He was on a normal diet and was thriving appropriately. The boy was admitted to the hospital for hemorrhagic shock. He was lethargic, very pale, with profound hypotonia, tachycardic, tachypnea, and alleguria. The child had a trauma. One day before his admission to the inner face of the lower lip, that caused an external acute bleeding loss. Results of hematological investigation are the following, and you can see them on the slide. The hemoglobin level at 3. However, um, there was normal leukocyte count, platelet count was also normal, protrombin time and fibrinogen level were normal. However, the partial thrombostin time was elongated. Blood was oozing from a wound at the inner surface of the lower lip. The gums appeared otherwise healthy. On the basis of the clinical presentation of hemorrhage, a tentative diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease has been made. Von Willebrand's disease is the commonest inherited bleeding disorder. However, despite an increasing understanding of pathophysiology of von Willebrand disease, the diagnosis of von Willebrand disease is frequently difficult because of uncertainty regarding the relationship between laboratory assays and function. In vivo. The aim of this case is to show that von Willebrand disease can be the cause of serious life-threatening hemorrhage. And given its prevalence and presenting symptoms, von Willebrand's disease should always be considered in the assessment of children suspected of non-accidental injury. The risk for increased bleeding should be kept in mind when medical procedures are undertaken in this hemostasis disorder. Now we are going to other pathological condition, thrombosis. Having reviewed the process of normal hemostasis, we now turn to the three primary abnormalities that lead to thrombus formation, the so-called Virco triad, endothelial injury, stasis or turbulent blood flow, 
and hypercoagulability of the blood. You're looking at so-called Virchow's triad in thrombosis that includes endothelial injury, abnormal blood flow, and hypercoagulability. Endothelial integrity is the most important factor. Abnormalities of procoagulants and or anticoagulants can tip the balance in favor of thrombosis. Abnormal blood flow, stasis or turbulence can lead to hypercoagulability directly and also indirectly through endothelial dysfunction. Endothelial injury is an important cause of thrombosis, particularly in the heart and the arteries, where high flow rates might otherwise impede clotting by preventing platelet adhesion or diluting coagulation factors. Examples of thrombosis related to endothelial damage are the formation of thrombi in the cardiac chambers after myocardial infar infarction, shown on the left picture with a yellow star. This thrombi forms over ulcerated plugs in atherosclerotic arteries shown on the right. Thus, dysfunctional endothelium elaborates greater amounts of procoagulant factors, including platelet adhesion molecules and tissue factors, and endothelium synthesizes lesser amounts of anticoagulant molecules including thrombomodulin. Endothelial dysfunction can be induced by a variety of insults, including hypertension, turbulent blood flow, bacterial products, radiation injury, metabolic abnormalities such as homocystinuria and hypercholesterolemia, and toxins absorbed from cigarette smoke. Turbulent blood flow stasis will be considered in the following slide. Turbulence contributes to arterial and cardiac thrombosis by causing endothelial injury or dysfunction, as well as by forming countercurrents and local pockets of stasis. Stasis is a major factor in the development of venous thrombi. Under conditions of normal laminar blood flow, platelets, along with other blood cells, are found mainly in the center of the vessel lumen, separated from the endothelium by slower-moving layer of plasma. By contrast, stasis or turbulent blood flow have the following deleterious effects. Both promote endothelial cells activation and enhanced procoagulant activity, in part through flow-induced changes in endothelial gene expression. Stasis allows platelets and leukocytes to come into contact with the endothelium when the flow is sluggish. Stasis also slows the washout of activated clotting factors and impedes the inflow of clotting factor inhibitors. On the picture, you see examples of normal laminar flow through the aortic valve shown by the yellow arrow and turbulent flow resulting from aortic stenosis shown by the black arrow. Turbulent and static Blood flow contribute to thrombosis in a number of clinical settings. 
ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques not only expose some subendothelial extracellular matrix, but also cause turbulence. Abnormal aortic dilations, called aneurysms, shown on the left picture, create local stasis and consequently a fertile site for thrombosis. Acute myocardial infarction results in focally non-contractile myocardium, ventricular remodeling after more remote infarction can lead to aneurysm formation shown on the right picture. Hypercoagulability contributes infrequently to arterial or intracardiac thrombosis but is an important underlying risk factor for venous thrombosis. It is loosely defined as any alteration of the coagulation pathways that predisposes affected persons to thrombosis and can be divided into primary or genetic and secondary or acquired disorder. Primary inherited hypercoagulability most often is caused by mutations in the factor V and prothrombin genes. Approximately 2 to 15 percent of whites carry a specific factor V mutation called the Leiden mutation after the Dutch city where it was first described. The mutation alters an amino acid residue in factor V and renders it resistant to protein C. Thus, an important antithrombotic counter-regulatory mechanism is lost. A single nucleotide substitution G2A in the free untranslated region of the prothrombin gene is a fairly common allele found in 1 to 2 percent of the general population. This variant results in increased prothrombin transcription and is associated with a nearly threefold increased risk for ven venous thrombosis. Inherited causes of hypercoagulability should be considered in young patients when a patient is younger than 50 years of age, even when other acquired risk factors are present. Secondary acquired hypercoagulability is seen in many settings. In some situations, like cardiac failure or trauma, stasis or vascular injury may be the most important factor. The hypercoagulability associated with oral contraceptive use and the hyperestrogenic state of pregnancy may be related to increased hepatic synthesis of coagulation factors and reduced synthesis of antithrombin-free in disseminated cancers, release of procoagulant tumor products like mucin from adenocarcinoma predisposes to thrombosis. The hypercoagulability seen with advancing age has been attributed to increased platelet aggregation and reduced release of prostaglandin from endothelium. Smoking and obesity also promote hypercoagulability by unknown mechanisms. Trombi can develop anywhere in the cardiovascular system. Arterial or cardiac trombi typically arise at sites of endothelial injury or turbulence, while venous trombi 
characteristically occur at sites of stasis. Trombi are focally attached to the underlying vascular surface and tend to propagate toward the heart. Thus, arterial trombi grow in a retrograde direction from the point of attachment, while venous trombi extend in the direction of blood flow. The propagating portion of the thrombus tends to be poorly attached and therefore prone to fragmentation and migration through the blood as an embolus. Thrombi can have grossly and microscopically apparent laminations called lines of zan. These represent pale platelet and fibrin layers alternating with darker red cell rich layers. Such lines are significant in that they are only found in thrombi that form in flowing blood. Their presence can therefore usually distinguish antemortem thrombosis from the bland non-laminated clots that form in the postmortem state. Although thrombi formed in the low flow venous system superficially resemble postmortem clots, careful evaluation generally reveals ill-defined laminations. Thrombi occurring in heart chambers or in the aortic lumen are designated mural thrombi. Abnormal myocardial contraction, arrhythmias, dilated cardiomyopathy or myocardial infection or endomyocardial injury as in case of myocarditis and catheter stroma promote cardiac mural thrombi, while ulcerated atherosclerotic plaques and aneurysmal dilation promote aortic thrombosis. Arterial thrombi are typically relatively rich in platelets, as the processes underlying their development lead to platelet activation. Although usually superimposed on a ruptured atherosclerotic plaque, other vascular injuries like vasculitis or trauma can also be causal. Venous thrombi. Phleba thrombosis frequently propagate some distance toward the heart, forming a long cast within the vessel lumen that is prone to giving rise to emboli. An increase in the activity of coagulation factors is involved in the genesis of most venous thrombi, with platelet activation playing a secondary role. Because the thrombi form in the sluggish venous circulation, they tend to contain more enmeshed red cells, leading to the moniker red or stasis thrombi. The veins of the lower extremities are most commonly affected. However, venous thrombi also can occur in the upper extremities, periprostatic plexus or ovarian and parauterine veins, and under special circumstances may be found in the dural sinuses, sinuses portal vein, or hepatic vein. At autopsy, postmortem clots can sometimes be mistaken for venous thrombi. However, the postmortem clots are gelatinous and due to red cells settling, have a dark red 
the pendant portion and the yellow chicken fat upper portion. They also are usually not attached to the underlying vessel wall. By contrast, red thrombi typically are firm, focally attached to vessel walls and contain great strands of deposit fibrin. Thrombi on heart valves are called vegetations. Bacterial or fungal blood-borne infections can cause valve damage, leading to the development of large thrombotic masses, as in case of infective endocarditis. Sterile vegetation can develop on non-infected valves in hypercoagulable states. The lesions of so-called non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. Less commonly, sterile verrucous endocarditis, Lehman Sachs endocarditis, on the right picture can occur in the setting of systemic lupus erythematosus. If a patient survives an initial thrombotic event, over the ensuing days to weeks the thrombus evolves through some combination of the following four processes. Propagation, embolization, dissolution, organization and recanalization. The thrombus enlarges through the accretion of additional platelets and fibrin, increasing the odds of vascular occlusion or embolization. This process is known as propagation. Part or all of the thrombus is dislodged and transported elsewhere in the vasculature. If a thrombus is newly formed, activation of fibrinolytic factors may lead to its rapid, rapid shrinkage and complete dissolution. With older thrombi, extensive fibrin polymerization renders the thrombus substantially more resistant to plasmin-induced proteolysis and lysis is ineffectual. The acquisition of resistance to lysis has clinical significance as therapeutic administration of fibrinolytic agents, including PTPA in the setting of acute coronary thrombosis, generally is not effective unless given within a few hours of thrombus formation. Older thrombi become organized by the ingrowth of endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and fibroblasts into the fibrin-rich thrombus. In time, capillary channels, shown by the black stars, are formed that to a limited extent create conduits along the length of the thrombus, thereby re-establishing the continuity of the original lumen. Further recanalization can sometimes convert a thrombus into a vascularized mass of connective tissue that is eventually incorporated into the wall of the remodeled vessel. On the right picture, you see a low power view of the thrombosed artery stain for hematoxylin and erythrin. The original lumen is delineated by the inter-internal inter elastic lamina shown by, by the arrows and is totally filled with organized thrombus. Occasionally, instead of organizing 
the center of thrombus undergoes enzymatic digestion, presumably because of the release of lysosomal enzymes from entrapped leukocytes. If bacterial seeding occurs, the contents of degraded thrombi serve as an ideal culture medium and the resulting infection may weaken the vessel wall, leading to formation of the mycotic aneurysm. I want to show you a case of intracranial mycotic aneurysm. A 43-year-old male patient was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin T-cell lymphoma. He was transplanted with allergenic peripheral stem cells and developed graft versus host disease. A few days before his last admission, he complained of severe coughing. A chest X-ray revealed an infiltrate in the right lung base. Antibiotic therapy has been started. A chest CT scan showed evidence that the right lower lobe infiltrates were fungal in nature. During his hospital course, the patient became confused and fell down. Imaging was performed including a CT scan and MRI of the head showing possible left basal ganglia abscess on the left picture. After a neurosurgical consultation, the patient was taken for surgery to evacuate the abscess under navigation guidance. Antifungal therapy was started after surgery. Two weeks after surgical evacuation of the abscess, patient developed seizures and sudden weakness on his left side that progressed to plagia. The patient underwent a CT scan of the head showing a right frontal hematoma with ventricular involvement and mass effect on the middle picture. An urgent CTA demonstrated a mycotic aneurysm on the right, <coughs> a right frontal craniotomy, a craniotomy was performed. The hematoma was evacuated and ventricular drain was placed in the surgical bed. The patient experienced a severe systemic involvement of infection he subsequently deteriorated and died a two weeks later. Histological analysis of the lesion showed that Aspergillus fumigatis was the causative agent. On the left, you see fungal invasion into brain microvasculature, uh, demonstrated by the black star. On the right, Close up view of blood vessel wall of brain showing also fungal invasion. Trombi are significant because they cause obstruction of arteries and veins and may give rise to emboli. Which effect is of greatest clinical importance? depends on the site of thrombosis. Thus, while venous thrombi can cause congestion and edema in vascular beds, distal to an obstruction, they are most worrisome because of their potential to embolize to the lungs and cause death. Conversely, while arterial thrombi can embolize and cause tissue infarction, their tendency to obstruct vessels, including coronary and cerebral vessels, is considerably more important. Most venous thrombi can occur in either the superficial or the deep veins of the leg. Superficial venous thrombi usually arise in the saphenous system particularly in the setting of varicosities. 
This rarely embolized but can be painful and can cause local congestion and swelling from impaired venous or outflow, predisposing the overlying skin to development of infections and varicose ulcers. Deep venous thrombosis in the larger leg veins at or above the knee joint are more serious because they are prone to embolize. Although such deep venous thrombosis may cause local pain and edema, the venous obstruction often, often is circumvented by collateral channel. Consequently, deep venous thrombosis are entirely asymptomatic in approximately 50% of patients and are recognized only after they have embolized to the lungs. Lower extremity deep venous thrombosis are associated with stasis and hypercoagulable states. Those common predisposing factors include the following congestive heart failure, bed rest and immobilization. The latter two factors reduce the milking action of leg muscles and thus slow venous return. Trauma, surgery and burns not only immobilize a patient but are also associated with vascular injury Procoagulant release increased hepatic synthesis of coagulation factors. Many factors contribute to the thrombotic diathesis of pregnancy, besides the potential of amniotic fluid infusion into the circulation at the time of delivery. Pressure produced by the enlarging fetus and uterus can produce stasis in the veins of the legs and late pregnancy and the postpartum period are associated with hypercoagulability. Tumor-associated procoagulant release is largely responsible for the increased risk of thromboembolic phenomena seen in disseminated cancers, which is sometimes referred to as migratory thrombophlebitis due to its tendency to transiently involve several different venous beds or estruso syndrome. Regardless of the specific clinical setting, the risk of deep venous thrombosis is increased in persons over 50. While the many conditions that predispose to thrombosis are well recognized, the phenomena remains unpredictable. It occurs at a distressingly high frequency in otherwise healthy and ambulatory people without apparent provocation or underlying abnormality. Equally important is, the, is that asymptomatic thrombosis and presumably subsequent resolution occurs considerably more frequently than is generally appreciated. Disseminated intravascular coagulation is a life-threatening syndrome characterized by disseminated and often uncontrolled activation of coagulation. This syndrome is associated with a high risk of macro and microvascular thrombosis and progressive consumption coagulopathy which leads to increased bleeding risk. Clinical conditions associated with disseminated intravascular coagulation may be triggered by sepsis, cancer, trauma, and obstetric calamity ranking amongst the most frequent triggering factors. The risk of disseminated intravascular coagulation is particularly high in patients with sepsis. Indeed, disseminated intravascular coagulation occurs 
in 30 to 50 percent of these patients, whereas the frequency of DAC is approximately 10 percent in patients with solid tumors, trauma, or obstetric calamities. The most common clinical manifestation of disseminated intravascular coagulation are bleeding, thrombosis, or both, often resulting in dysfunction of one or more organs. A schematic representation of the clinical manifestations of coagulation abnormalities in disseminated intravascular coagulation is shown in the picture. The classical characteristic laboratory findings include prolonged clotting time, prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, thrombin time, increased levels of fibrin-related markers, fibrin degradation products, D-dimers, low platelet count and fibrinogen levels, low plasma levels of coagulation factors such as factor 5 and 7 and coagulation inhibitors such as antithrombin and protein C. The thrombi are generally microscopic in size, yet so numerous as to often cause circulatory insufficiency, particularly in the brain, lungs, heart and kidneys. On the picture you see renal glomerulus and all the capillaries are blocked by thrombi, shown by the arrows. To complicate matters, the widespread microvascular thrombosis consumes platelets and coagulation proteins, hence the seminine consumption coagulopathy. And at the same time, fibrinolytic mechanisms are activated. Thus, an initially thrombotic disorder can evolve into a bleeding catastrophe. A point worthy of emphasis is that disseminated intravascular coagulation is not a primary disease, but rather a potential complication of numerous conditions associated with widespread activation of thrombin. On the pictures, you see variable degrees of epidermal and dermal necrosis. There are extensive intravascular thrombi within capillaries and venules shown by black arrows. You can see histological findings in the lung tissue. Normal lung presented on the left picture and thrombus formation shown on the right by arrow in capillaries. In the next slides, we will look at two cases relevant for our topic today, thrombosis. Alexander Fleming was a Scottish microbiologist, Nobel Prize winner and inventor of penicillin. He died suddenly at his home in Chelsea, London, after a heart attack. He was 74 at the moment of his death. I suggest on this slide several questions for you to consider looking into the Fleming's case. Explain whether there is a link between myocardial infarction of Alexander Fleming and his intense academic work which led to the discovery of penicillin or if there is a connection between myocardial infarction and his Nobel Prize. Explain the development of myocardial infarction from the standpoint of the modern theory of unstable atherosclerotic plaque. 
explain the process of injury of myocardium in myocardial infection. What mechanism underlies the development of myocardial injury during the heart attack? There are several stages of myocardial infection. Describe the morphological basis for each stage of myocardial infection. Keeping in mind the mechanisms of development of myocardial infarction, at what stage of the disease the treatment should be administered in order to prevent the heart attack. Keeping in mind the mechanisms of development of myocardial infarction, are there morphological features in the elderly persons? What diseases should be considered during the differential diagnosis of myocardial infarction in the elderly. Considering the sudden death of Professor Fleming from myocardial infarction, describe the possible changes that happened in his heart that could have been found during an autopsy. Explain the possible early complications of myocardial infarction which led to the death of Professor Fleming. Um, the second case concerns a famous Italian painter and sculptor, architect, musician, mathematician, engineer, inventor, anatomist, geologist, cartographer, botanist and writer Leonardo da Vinci. He is widely considered to be one of the greatest painters of all time and perhaps the most diversely talented person ever to have lived. Leonardo has often been described as the archetype of the Renaissance man, a man of unquestionable curiosity and feverishly inventive imagination. The last years of his life Leonardo spent in France. He was aging, frail, and according to some biographers, his left or right hand was paralyzed by a stroke, experienced back in 1570. He was bedridden for many months. On April 1519, Leonardo wrote his last will. He died on May 2nd, 1519 in Amboise when he was about 67 years old. Consider the following questions looking at this case. For the last four years of his life, Leonardo lived in France in one of the palaces of the French king, but none of his projects received any funding or support from the king. Is it possible to explain the development of a stroke in Leonardo by his constant dissatisfaction about the fate of his technical projects? Explain your answer. What were the potential causes of stroke in case of Leonardo da Vinci? Explain your opinion by connecting each cause with development of the stroke. What were morphological manifestations of stroke in Leonardo da Vinci gross section microscopy? Please take into consideration the fact of unilateral paralysis in case of Leonardo da Vinci. What morphological changes could have been observed in Willis circle vessels in case of Leonardo da Vinci which led to the stroke? Explain your opinion. What morphological changes could have been observed in carotid arteries and vertebral arteries in case of this patient which contributed to the development of the stroke? Explain your opinion. Explain the pattern of morphological injury of the central nervous system in case of the stroke, taking into consideration the age and health condition of Leonardo da Vinci and pay attention to the first 24 hours. After the stroke, Leonardo da Vinci lived for another two years. Explain the dynamics of changes of the central nervous system in the area of stroke. 
in a month, in six months, in a year. There are several stages of stroke. What are major morphological differences between every stage of stroke? Due to the fact that Leonardo lived for two years after the stroke, is it possible to assume that the stroke was somehow peculiar? Explain your answer. Are there morphological patterns of the stroke in elderly patients like Leonardo da Vinci? Explain your answer. Thank you for your attention.